Good evening. Good evening. We are going to get things started here real quick. And the first thing we always like to do, before we get started, anyone who served in the U.S. military, please rise. Well, get up, get up. Yeah. <laughs> here, you need this. Now, this is where we rise. We're going to my right, and we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You can be seated. Um, we want to welcome everyone to the Wayne County Historical Society and the Luna Museum tonight. And we're going to have a pretty good uh, program tonight, I believe. Um, before we get started, we always open with prayer. And Gary Feisman, would you open us tonight with prayer? Lord, we thank you once again for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for the outpouring and the uh, attendance that has... Uh, honored this place and honored all of us in the historical society and lord we just thank you for this is yet another day to enjoy lord that you've made just for us thank you lord for all the blessing even just now we thank you lord for the one who comes to speak we ask special blessing on him and we pray we'd honor you with all that we do we pray this in your name and your honor amen, amen. amen. before i turn over to our speaker i've got a few announcements i'd like to make um, we got a lot going on in the Wayne County Historical Society right now. We're having uh, uh, several different fundraisers. Uh, to my left, or we have ordered uh, several at Wayne County t-shirts to honor the, the uh, Bicentennial of Missouri this year. They're $15. And uh, if you'd like to purchase one, we have all sizes from children up to adults. Uh, see me after the program and I will sort through them and get your size uh, we have a, we're having a gun raffle for a fundraiser and that is for a savage 308 with a scope tickets are five dollars or you get five tickets for twenty dollars that will be uh, um, drawn at the fourth of july picnic in greenville on july 3rd see ron hensher after the meeting if you're interested in tickets for that um, and also, we have these. We're really interested in these, aren't we, Ron? Yes. Yeah. If you're not a member of the Historical Society, pick one of these up, fill it out, give us $15 for an annual membership or a $100 uh, for, a, for a lifetime. You want to fool with it again. But if you're not a member, don't leave them tonight unless you are. <laughs> um, we have also our, our books, our, our normal books. We have cemetery books, we have census records, we have uh, uh, Cletus Ellinghouse's books we sell. Um, very good assortment of historical local history. And we do have some upcoming events. Uh, and this is the Bicentennial, uh, Bicentennial of Missouri, uh, 2021, and we are going to support the, the statewide ice cream social that will be held on August the 10th. And it is uh, in cooperation with the Midway Cook Shack in our county seat at Greenville. From 2 to 5, you can go there on August the 10th on a Tuesday and get a free ice cream. And uh, that's a statewide event. So we, Historical Society would like everyone to take part in that and honor our bicentennial. And later that night, at 7 o'clock on August the 10th, we are going to meet at Eagle Sky of the Ozarks. And that will be our August meeting for the first and uh, we're excited about this this is the first annual wayne county hall of honor banquet and we are going to celebrate the contributions of the first inductees uh, reverend ezekiel rubottom hiram holiday charles Ellinghouse, bernice e. larry twidwell reverend l.a davis virtual club laverne names helen price bernard mcfadden governor sam a baker rose fulton kramer and the ozark harmony boys it's, the tickets are $25, so it's going to have a good meal and uh, a good program. And uh, Brenda Seal, who is a member of our historical site and a great banquet coordinator, is going to put that together for us. And um, it's going to be a, a, 
exciting night, I believe, and a historical night for Wayne County. And on our historical side, he's also going to continue to participate, participate in the 4th of July picnic at Greenville this year, Old Greenville Days, Those Are Characters Festival, and maybe the Williamsville Labor Day. I haven't heard, haven't heard that for sure yet. So those are some announcements. And um, we'll have a short business meeting later, very short. And but right now, we're going to turn it over to Dennis Hovis, and um, he's a member of our Historical Society and a great community member. And I'll say this, I told the board this when we talked about getting this, I'm as Baptist as anybody in here. But something happened in Piedmont, Missouri in 1973, and I don't know what it was, but uh, Dennis hopefully can enlighten us some more. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Dennis Hovis. I'm sorry, we have to have this one get more working. If it grows idle for a little while. David, I want to thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a very unusual happening that occurred in this area. For all of you who do not like remember, it's 39 years ago, Joe, Margaret. Okay? Uh, the interest at that time was very phenomenal. And uh, with spaceships flying again all over the nation, this is a timely night to have this program. In 1973, I was the general manager and news reporter for KPWB radio station here in Piedmont, Missouri. As you may know, this area has a, a lot of natural beauty. All of us that have been growing up here all these years, a lot of beautiful forest land, clear springs, beautiful rivers. We're located between two U.S. Army Corps of Engineers man-made lakes, Clearwater and Wapapella, and that has something to do with all this UFO business, okay? Uh, with all this beautiful natural area we have, it attracts a lot of tourists. But apparently in 1973, the area also attracted UFOs. Not only UFOs, but news reporters from around the nation came to Piedmont. It was UFO headquarters. And I gotta tell you, that was only the beginning. Here. It's scared, scared to death. This is the time. Well, yeah, lots of people were scared. And uh, the first newsworthy sighting was February the 21st, 1973. That's when Clearwater basketball coach Reggie Bone and five of his team members were returning to Piedmont after a game. Now they were driving along an area that you all know as Brushy Creek, down around Mill Spring, Missouri. It was uh, winter time and it was dark. I think it was a little wet that night also. 
earlier the team and reggie had been driving back from a basketball game and one of the boys over around highway sixty seven had seen a shaft of light in the night sky they didn't pay much attention to it but then they got on brushy creek and one of the boys shouted out there's that thing we saw earlier and so reggie stopped the car they all jumped out and they witnessed an object that was hovering above a farm field the only thing we said uh, we saw that it was a real dark night and it was about two hours before the moon came up and if anybody can recall this particular night it was very very dark and uh as i said the thing was in a tree line and the only thing that we could see was a rotation of, of uh, lights the lights were red green amber and white and uh, of course being familiar with a little familiar with airplanes i knew that uh, uh although i didn't say anything at the time that this wasn't an airplane and uh, at least wasn't the markings of an aircraft they type that uh, i've seen before well because of the darkness they were unable to determine any shape to it that night they looked at it for about 10 minutes and then the object suddenly just went straight up in the air the lights went out there was no noise and it shot over a hill and it was gone there was not a lot made about this particular sighting and until some of reggie's family got talking about ufos and they went ufo hunting that was pretty common in 1973. then the students in high school began to talk about it and they began to go hunting and then the word got out all over the area this was all happening sometime during March of 1973. Reggie Bone, well, Reggie was born here in Wayne County. He was a close friend. Reggie died at a very young age. He was only 48 years old. But he and his team really experienced an unusual event, and they never really, really got an answer to what they saw that cold winter night. The night coach Bone and his team watched the lighted object fly over that hill Another person spotted what may have been the same object. Edith Boatwright, Mrs. Boatwright lived on the other side of the hill and she reported to me what she had witnessed. Now I went to Mrs. Boatwright's house, kind of a funny story. She was a little short lady and she took me back to her bedroom to get this interview. And she said I was in bed. Well, I was looking out the window to see where the spaceship had been flying from and I looked around and she was in bed. <laughs> and that's where I interviewed Mrs. Boatwright, in bed. Because <laughs> that's where she saw this object, okay? <laughs> well, <laughs> she said she wasn't asleep when she saw this flashing light in the night sky. And she told me it was a craft about 200 feet off the ground in a horizontal position that made a soft swishing sound. Now, she didn't recognize it as a helicopter but estimated it to be over 30 feet long and have a light colored body. Now keep in mind, this is what Reggie and his team had seen just over the hill. They're pretty close there, isn't it, Joe? I mean, you know where they were at there. And so she's describing pretty close to what Reggie and the boys had seen. Could have been the same object. Well, from February into late April, sightings occurred nightly with over 500 reported sightings to local police during this time. Some saw the object more than once. Earl Turnbow, who lived in that Brushy Creek area and farmed the area, his first encounter was the 1st of March while he was traveling home and he said he spotted something hovering over the road. <laughs> and he told me, he said, it lit up like a carnival. And then it went out. About two weeks later in the same area, he saw an amber light in a farm field. It was raining, and when the lightning flashed, he saw a, a dome-shaped object with an antenna at the top. It was raining, but he still told me more than once what he had seen that night. Now, his last sighting was a week later while feeding the cattle at the farm. It was dusk, and he saw something come down Brushy Creek. And it was about a 1,000 feet above the creek, and it was shaped like a top. The lights remember the colors about Reggie Bone and his crew. The colors were yellow, green, and red. 
and it traveled over the farm without any sound. I did an interview with Mr. Turnbull and he told me whatever it was, he, <laughs> he sure didn't want it to get him or one of his boys. Here's Mr. Turnbull. I've got this kind of cookie. I don't know what cookie. I'm kind of like Frank Wood. I, I got to talk to Frank. He says, I hope there isn't uh, somebody in here trying to get me or one of my boys. <laughs> well, they didn't get Mr. Turnbull or one of his boys, but he was concerned about that. Now the sightings, and Mary's going to move around here a little bit so you can watch this video, because now the sightings appear on Clearwater Lake, which is about five miles from Brushy Creek, okay? Uh, as many of you know, Clearwater Lake's an earth dam built in 1944. It's on Black River, and it covers about 1,500 acres. It was about 9 o'clock on March the 21st when uh, Mrs. Jean Coleman and Kathy Leach were uh, crossing the dam and they uh, were alerted by a red flash on the lake. Uh, they stopped and they got out of the car and they witnessed blinking lights that were ascending. Now each time the red light flashed, the object got brighter. And with no sound, the object continued to rise and finally circled out of sight. Now, Mrs. Leach is now deceased and Mrs. Coleman is a retired teacher, but they were interviewed uh, and I was interviewed at the same time for the Travel Channel and the History Channel. And here's a part of the video of that interview with the, uh, Jean and Kathy. And we'll get that playing for you here in just a moment. And at, we'll do the best we can to show you this video. I hope you can see some of it anyway. Let me know if the screen is that bad angle. That the object the officers saw and the other objects that seem to be flying along the 37th parallel are due to human ingenuity or could they be the product of an unknown technology? While Chuck wrestles with this question, he tracks down a study carried out by Professor of Physics Harley Rutledge from Southeast Missouri State University. In the first academic investigation into unidentified craft carried out in the United States, Rutledge records his observations of mysterious objects in the sky. Here's a physics professor that saw flying craft and he has no idea who's propelling it. He actually thinks it's some unknown technology. But there's something else about project identification that fascinates Chuck. All the information in this book it pertains to eyewitness reports in Piedmont, Missouri. Piedmont, Missouri sits on a 37 degree parallel. I think it's a good place to go, interview some eyewitnesses. With his suspicions that the U.S. Air Force know more about the mysterious craft than they want to reveal, Chuck wants to see if there really is a connection to the military. Piedmont, Missouri sits right at the heart of Chuck's paranormal freeway. One of the most remarkable sightings takes place in March 1973 above Clearwater Lake, which is built by the U.S. Army in the 1940s. To the left of the lake? Yep. What did you actually see that night? The first thing that I saw was uh, a red light. The first time I saw it flash, I didn't say anything. And then it flashed again. And I said, Kathy, I said, there is something out there. Yeah. And so I stopped on the dam. Every time it would flash, because of the hill there, you could see that it had gone up higher. And then after it got so high, there were white lights that was around it. They came on and then they flashed. But after it got so high in the sky, all the lights came on and stayed on. And then it just circled and went over the hill. Right, right up there. Mm -hmm. Right over to the right side over mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, it seemed made, like it seemed awesome. <laughs> but it made no noise. There no. Was no noise. Did no you noise. hear any noise at all? Did you no smell noise. anything unusual? No. Mm -hmm. So here we have some type of craft with lights, circular lights, no sound, no smell. Just what do you think it was? Well, I had a lot of people tell me that it was probably one of those jump jets. And I was raised on the RAF base. No, it wasn't a jump jet. No, I believe it was. I believe it was a UFO. In my mind, I thought, you know, if, if they're an alien, uh, what can we do? 
I mean, they're here. I have a brother that retired from the Royal Air Force, and I told him about it after I went home. He said, well, leave it alone. <laughs> Unbelievable as it sounds, Chuck is being slowly drawn to the conclusion that the objects flying along the 37th parallel, whoever's behind them, have a performance capability beyond our current understanding. So far, everything I've seen, not only Colorado or Illinois and Missouri, leads me to believe that... You can pick up some of these shows on the History Channel and the Travel Channel. They're still in there. Alien Highway and Mayhem in Missouri. And uh, um, I, I can't think of any other ones for sure. Uh, uh, Mr. Shatner, who starred on Star Trek, is uh, part of all those programs. But... The story doesn't stop here because of that. It continues because Ken Johnson, who was the owner of a, a nearby boat dock, Piedmont Park boat dock, he was informed by some campers that they had witnessed this object and it was moving under the surface of the water. And when they put a flashlight on the object, the lights disappeared. And then the next night, one of our news reporters, Dennis Keeney, he was driving down in the Brushy Creek area chasing uh, something. He didn't know what it was. We all were chasing something, I think, at that time. He said it was a large orange light glowing white to yellow, and, and it was traveling from Piedmont toward Brushy Creek, and he gave pursuit. Yeah, he did, but as he neared the object, his radio went off, first of all, and then his car stalled, and that was the last of it. He couldn't follow it after that. Now, earlier that same day, he happens to be with us tonight, so you can see a real person that really saw something. Uh, school teachers, uh, Joe King and Ronnie Miller. Uh, they had a daytime sighting near Piedmont, one of the few. It was around 4.30 in the afternoon. They were driving on State Highway 34, I think, near Patterson. That's where they observed a, a, a disc-shaped object just above the treetops. Uh, they described it as being a metallic in color, oval shaped with a flat bottom, and it flew very rapidly with no sound. Here's Joe King. Very and just past, just this side of the road that turns off to the park, you saw a, a silvery object in the sky far to the left. It wasn't too far above the tree line. And it was brown kind of a round shape, it was flat on the bottom, it kind of had an oval top. And it was fairly good size, and it was shining, you could see the sun shining, blasting off of it. Mm -hmm. And it was moving, and it sort of seemed like it moved to our left, and then it just kind of disappeared down behind the tree line. And we turned around, and we went back, we didn't know for sure, we still don't know what it was, but anyway, we went back through Patterson looking for it. Then we turned around and came back and drove in the same in the same place. Looked up the hill as we were going. Couldn't see anything there, so whatever it was was there and it was gone. And we saw it for about well we watched it for about thirty seconds or so. Joe, uh, could this have been a uh, cloud formation? I don't think so because it was real bright. It, it, I mean, it looked it looked metallic. You could see you could. You could just see the glare off of it. I don't think it. I don't think it was a cloud formation. Did you possibly see any vapor trail from it? No, we didn't see anything like that. All, all we could see was a, was a, an object. And when I saw it, the, the, the picture in the paper tonight, that one that was blown up on the front page, if you kind of if you just block off the point that was on the top and the bottom of the thing, it was kind of a similar shape to that. It didn't have a, it wasn't a shape like the gyroscope in the picture exactly. Well, he's here. You could have been flying saucer. <laughs> you know, only Joe knows, maybe. Joe doesn't know. No, Joe doesn't know. <laughs> Joe well, never said. No, Joe never said. He just said it was unusual. And it was even more unusual because the following evening, Piedmont residents witnessed a, a close encounter. I call it the night a ship flew over Piedmont. It was March 
of 1973. It was about 7 o'clock when the lights appeared very bright and low over the community. Uh, the lights blinked and then it shot up about 300 feet and then it flew over the KPWB radio station tower. Now since I signed on each morning at that time, I went to the station that morning to turn all the power on and our transmitter had been blown. We couldn't sign on that day because of that. We don't know what <coughs> happened, but that unusual ship flying over Piedmont over the towers might have been the problem. Well, with all these many sightings, Piedmont became UFO headquarters, you know. News teams came to town from around the Midwest and UFO sightseers came hoping to get a glimpse of the mysterious flying lights. Traffic became heavy in the Brushy Creek area and everyone was excited as they visited and kept looking to the heavens for the lights. I suspect there were hundreds of people in that Brushy Creek area at some time. The traffic was tremendous. Highway patrolmen were down there sometimes and most everyone had a pair of binoculars or a camera wrapped around their neck. Everyone was excited and everyone had a story to tell. Here's a story Carl Laxton told me. This is train horses. We're driving uh, the last three nights we've been looking uh, for this object and haven't saw it. And we gave up last night with coming home. That's up uh, 49 Highway to Mill Spring. And just below Mill Spring, well, Ronnie spotted it uh, coming uh, all from east to west. We got out of our car and uh, we both had binoculars. And, and of course, they had the flashing red light and the flashing green light. I had what I call a, a strobe light, uh, like on an airplane, a real bright light that flashes on and off. Now, uh, it got past us in the sky. I'd say it was two, two, between two and 3,000 feet off the ground. Now, when it passed us, the, the flashing light, the real fl bright flashing light went off, and of course, about that time, I had it in my binoculars real good, and, and it decided to go back the way of the path that it came from, and, uh, and of course, when it did, it, it, it just went straight up, and of course, and kind of banked to the right. Uh, then after it got leveled out again, then the flashing light came back on. And as it came back to the east again, then, then there, Ronnie spotted one coming from south to north. And it was much lower, about 1,000 feet, I'd say, above the treetop, and it had two flashing red lights. And they were real beautiful. Uh, you, you just got to see it to, to really enjoy it. The, the light. Now, what amazes me is the speed. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't have any way of knowing how fast. Of course, I fly, and, and, and I, of course, you do get illusions, I know that too, in the, uh, from the curvature of the earth, how far anything is, or how fast it's going. I'd say if it was a jet airplane, which of course it isn't because there isn't any noise, but I'd say to have to break the sound barrier if, if it was. That's how fast it, it goes. And, uh, and that's just about it. Uh, uh, later, then after that, why we spotted again. Of course, we went to Brushy Creek and parked, and we saw it back in the same area, and Ronnie drove 70 miles an hour to try to get up there and hit it off. Of course, it was headed to the lake. We didn't spot it. It was going toward the lake. Well, <laughs> Carl is gone now, but I knew Carl very well, and that's a true story. Residents were looking in the night sky for many nights, many stalls, a lot of strange lights, and uh, then there was Maud Jeffries. Maudie was our photographer in this area, and she uh, began to make us think about it a little bit. What is this thing? Her photos appeared in many papers around the nation, along with articles about the Piedmont UFO. I have an article that was in a 
paper in China even about the UFOs in Piedmont. So it was all, it was a worldwide event. The UFO investigators came to town also. They had teams out interviewing anyone that had a sighting. Then the big guns came to town. By that I mean former Air Force consultant and noted astronomer J. Allen Hynek of Project Blue Book arrived. There's a TV series called Project Blue Book, okay, on the History Channel. And it's all about J. Allen Hynek. It's his story. It's what he saw and what he didn't see. And uh, it's interesting that you might find it. It's on the History Channel or the Travel Channel. I'm not sure which one, but uh, he, uh, he came to Piedmont. He interviewed several people about their sightings. Now remember, J. Allen Hynek eventually became a believer in UFOs, but at this time in history, after working for the Air Force for so many years, he was a squasher of UFOs. He purposely went around to downplay any type of UFO information. But he did tell us that about 80% of the sightings were explainable, and I understand that. Street lights, car lights, the trash, the dump. At that time, our Dove City dump was burning, and some people thought that was a UFO landing out there, you know. <laughs> but there was no explanation about the other 20%. So we didn't have any answers. And so we went looking for answers, mainly the radio station. We were involved so heavily, we went looking for answers. We called the Air Force. We found out that Scott Air Force Base uh, is about 150 miles from Piedmont, and then there's Whiteman Air Force Base near Kansas City, Missouri. We were checking to see if they had any unusual things flying in our area. Whiteman bases the B-2 stealth bomber and the Air Force Global Strike Command there, and Scott Air Base controls all the logistics of the U.S. military, air and land. So they could have been doing something, but they swore they were not. So with all this news coverage and questions still unanswered and the termination of the Air Force Project Blue Book in 1969, citizens in the area were without any military or scientific help. At that time, our congress congressman was Bill Burleson. How many of you remember Bill Burleson? Yeah, I figured you probably would. He made inquiries for us, but told us that you'll just have to have the citizens call the law enforcement. Well, they didn't know anything about it either. <laughs> Did the Air Force have any interest? None that I was aware of, except a visit by two men in civilian clothing questioning me about UFO sightings. After the interview, I peeked into their car and I noticed their Air Force uniforms hanging inside. They never identified themselves as Air Force. So today, I think maybe they were aliens. <laughs> <laughs> well, to make the whole thing even more strange, let me step back to 1971. The chill of December was in the air and it was evening and Reggie Bone and his wife Mary, along with two other couples, were traveling in the Brushy Creek area when they suddenly came upon something walking alongside the road. That something was dressed in a frogman's outfit. Okay, you know, the black leather from head to toe. And it also had flippers on its feet. Now this is December, it's very cold. It's about one o'clock in the morning. And they were a mile from the river and there they come to get us. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no house nearby. It was very silent in that car, Reggie told me, for quite a few miles. Suddenly someone yelled out, did you see that? <laughs> no answer, no answer. People are confused as to what they saw or what they were hearing about. UFO watchers kept coming and our news team was getting wore out with all the phone calls and questions. But along came Dr. Harley Rutledge. He was physics professor from Southeast Missouri University in Cape Toronto. He was skeptical, skeptical pardon me, about these UFO sightings. So he went UFO hunting and, and did for several weeks. It was April 1973 and we became very close friends. He was a kind man, very intelligent, skeptical, but not unbelieving. After seeing a news story featuring Maude Jeffries and her UFO photos, two of Dr. Rutledge's colleagues jokingly suggested he go investigate these UFOs in Piedmont. 
Well, Dr. Rutledge told them that he wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> Two weeks later, he arrived. <laughs> and this was the beginning of a seven-year study of UFOs. In his project identification, he writes about our first meeting. Um, this is a book that he gave me that is not in publication any longer. You can find one on eBay. Right now they're selling for about three to five hundred dollars, believe it or not, because of the UFO <laughs> garbage that's going around out there, I guess, you know. He says in his book, he says, my involvement get, began six weeks after the bone sighting. Euclid, Euclid and I and our wives drove to Piedmont on Friday afternoon, April 6th, <clears throat> pardon me, to learn firsthand what was beginning there. After we crossed US 67, we were in San Francisco Mountains, UFO country, another 15 miles, and we came to the eastern portion of Piedmont. Just before turning onto Main Street, we saw the Walter Motel. On the marquee was the message, welcome UFO people. Many of you remember that. Now remember what the other side proclaimed, Piedmont is UFO headquarters. <laughs> Photographs of the marquee had appeared in newspapers. We continued to cross town on Main Street until we came to an A-frame structure with KPWB 1140 on its slanted roof. You'll like this part. As we entered, I noticed that the clock in the small broadcast studio read 5.30. Smiling, a husky, light-haired man in his early 30s rose to greet us. Are you Dr. Rutledge from Cape Toronto, he asked. Chief Bearden had told him that we were coming. Yes, I am, I replied. Well, I'm Dennis Ovis. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. I introduced Euclid and then our wives. Euclid and I seated ourselves near Hovis, who began to relate accounts of some of the more important sightings, starting with the much-publicized phone report. Most people in the area had reported their sightings to him at the radio station. During our interview, he was interrupted a couple of times to listen to UFO reports that listeners were phoning in. The calls lent a strangeness to our visit. Obviously, the radio station was the real Piedmont UFO headquarters. After Hobus finished his report to us, he asked if we planned to visit Maude Jeffries to in inspect her photographs. Apparently, this was a ritual for all visiting dignitaries who professed a genuine interest in UFOs. His esteem for Mrs. Jeffries was evident. The telephone rang again and Hobus rushed to answer. When the conversation concluded, he said excitedly, I don't remember that, but I guess I did. He said, there's been a UFO landing on Clark's Mountain. This high school boy just called about it. His parents saw it too and they are reliable. Why don't we go out there? It's only a couple of miles the other side of Piedmont. You came by it on the way in. After a green, I nodded at Euclid and winked. <laughs> His answering grin assured me that he too believed the report was somewhat far-fetched. When we got into the car, I said, Milton, this could be a big put on for our benefits. And he agreed. That was our meeting. Well, at that time, and as time went on, Dr. Rutledge would bring his students to Piedmont and they would camp out overnight for UFO investigations. He became a very intense man in his search for answers. He set up sophisticated telescopes, sound detectors, camera equipment, electromagnetic frequency analyzers. He set up, listen to this, he set up over 150 viewing stations with more than 600 observers watching the sky at various times. His visit led to a seven-year research project and publication of his book, Project Identification, on his experience studying UFOs. He conducted the first UFO scientific field study. Dr. Rutledge died in 1980 at the age of 80, but he concluded that there is a UFO phenomenon. In his book, Dr. Rutledge commented that, and I quote him, a relationship, a coexistence between us and their UFO intelligence evolved. A game was played. He would eat dinner with Mary and I and tell us that these objects were playing games with him. He would see them and then they would dart away. And that's what lots of people saw. They kind of teased you. They're teasing today, if you notice on the news reports, the Air Force is really concerned and got lots of people concerned now. 
He goes on and says, in my opinion, this additional consideration is more important than the measurements of our establishment that the phenomenon exists. This facet of the USO phenomena perturbed me as much as the advanced technology we observed. It is a facet I cannot really fathom, and I have thought about it every day for more than seven years. In his book, Project Identification, his final writing was that more UFO flaps, and this is his writing, that more UFO flaps will occur from location to location winning converts. What's happening today? What is happening today? More people, he said, will believe in UFOs. And he had a very interesting thought about that. He said, if we learn their secrets, they must be studied scientifically with instruments. When we understand them on a technical, scientific basis, when most of the world's inhabitants accept the reality of UFOs, then we will meet them face to face, and then we will know their mission. Dr. Rutledge. Dr. Rutledge, if I'm not mistaken, lost his chairmanship of the head of the physics department at Southeast Missouri State University over this very thing. But he was still a reliable, fine, fine man. His son still lives in Texas. He's been here before and made, talks to us a lot of times. But it was an interesting time, really. The UFOs were flying. Some of the sightings were very unusual, like Reggie Bones, Gene Coleman's, Joe King's, many others. There were other sightings that we'll never know about since some people would just not tell their story and I really understand why. But what was happening in Piedmont in 1973? That year was very rainy. So was it swamp gas? Maybe a satellite? Or was it an unidentified flying object? I think so. This was some kind of aerial phenomena, unexplainable. These UFOs have been around a long time and no one has been able to explain what they see. Now it's cloudy tonight. Maybe tomorrow night it won't be. But the first clear night, not in the city, but out in the country, go out there and take a look at the night sky. Sit down and take a look at the night sky. Not a glance, but a long, long look. You're going to be amazed at what you see. Once you do that, like Joe, Carl, Reggie, so many others, go try to explain it to someone. much we enjoyed presenting our program to you this evening it's been a long time since we've done this and uh, we've forgotten some of it but I appreciate your attentive time tonight thank you very much oh yeah sure yeah you questions? Any questions I do I have a question yeah sure what is the no-fly zone between Piedmont and Grandin where you can't fly, is that any relationship to what's flying around Piedmont and the no-fly, military no-fly area? Yes, ma'am, and, and I, know, I, know basically, I know basically what you're talking about uh, uh, because there were several sightings in the Elsinore area. In fact, in the Elsinore area, uh, there was an area, there's some photographs of it where uh, the timber in uh, a very large area was circled down, uh, like you've seen in those uh, movies where the fields are circled out. This was this was a, a an area of the forest that was uh, that was circled around and down, and and they couldn't really understand what caused that, you know. And uh, but yeah, that uh, that could have some bearing on all this. But I again, not scientific at all. I don't know. Well, I have another statement too because I went to Grandin to go to that, like the Black River Cafe or whatever, so I Googled it up. So I went onto the street zone, and I was looking at the Google street map, and we went due north, facing here, facing Piedmont. There are three UFOs in that Google picture. 
and Google Maps. And there I was like, I blown it up and go, I can't even believe this. Now they're playing with you. I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. My ex father in law, which I don't like to talk about too much, he uh, was coming back from Griggsville to uh, Quincy. And he drove an 85 Dodge 500. And they were running along, I, I forget the route now, I don't know if it's 36 or whatever. And all of a sudden they seen a light over to their left. He couldn't tell what it was. Next thing you know, his lights went down, radio went off just like you were describing a while ago. They, they just sat there. And when it disappeared, he started his car up, went on about his business. And that was in the state of Illinois. Yes, and yes. another thing I wanted to ask you about. I lived in Jefferson County back in uh, 70, 69, 70. And Troy of Lincoln County, Jefferson County, we had cattle. They were being mutilated. And they had surgery performed on those cattle uh, that they, it was precision surgery. I, I think it was, it couldn't be done at that time. And they never did solve that problem, but it was in Lincoln and Jefferson County. And uh, I am referring to the lights all ago. I used to haul propane all over this country down here. Sitting over Puxco one night, and I had a spotlight on my truck. I'm sitting there, it takes about 45 minutes to pump off, so I'm looking. I see this real bright light, and I watched it. it seemed like it you know, kind of move around. It was a, it's a distance from me. I was always told if you shine a bright light in that direction, it won't set, it won't stay still. I put my spotlight on what I was seeing, and it moved. Every time I do that, it moved one way or the other. It would not stand still. That was one experience that I had. But the surgery we never did figure it out in Jefferson County and Lincoln County. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, sir. Does, um, yes, there sir. were, I'm not sure what years, but um, there were some. Really, uh, um, there's some sightings around Belleville and Millstock. There Illinois. was, yes. It, was this about the same time? Yes, it was, sir. Okay, that's yes. what I was thinking mm -hmm. of. I think a police officer uh, followed one of them. Uh, I don't remember the details, but I know there were a lot of sightings up in that area yeah. also. Yes. I just wonder. I knew there was. I just wondered if it was about the same time. Yes, it was, sir. Do you think that, uh, I've heard one theory that all these current UFO sightings are actually misinformation put out by the government to fool our uh, adversaries such as China and Russia. <coughs> think that's a possibility? <coughs> when it comes to the political part of our nation, uh, anything can be put out there today, so I don't know. You know. You're right there. <laughs> well, I would ask you. Have yes, ma'am. Have you ever been out to Sedalia and seen the B-2 bombers? I, I didn't hear you. I'm have sorry. you actually been out by Sedalia and seeing the B-2s. No, I have not. Well, you just need to go out. Oh, but, but I've been through there, seen them. I've seen them fly through, yeah, they're, they're beautiful. You don't they're, hear them. They're big. Because yeah. my, my son worked on it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I got to go inside one. Oh, they are, they are, they are beautiful planes. And you won't hear them. You don't yeah. hear them. They don't fly out like a plane. They go yeah. straight up in the air and they come straight down. They're great. You don't hear a thing. You, I mean, you don't even hear them. If you just happen to look up, you might see one day or night out there. Yes, sir. You sound like an Apache helicopter. I'll, I'll second one thing she said. Yeah. I lived next to Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City for 16 years. And one of the most unique experiences I had in my life was seeing a B-2 <laughs> fly over my backyard at night mm -hmm. with no running lights. Me and friends were barbecuing, and all we saw was a black triangle mm -hmm. coming towards us. We're all three standing there going, what is that? Yeah. And you couldn't even hear it until it was directly overhead. Interesting, yes. And it was low. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. What I'm the, sorry. One of the things that interests me as, a, as someone who's a relatively young man, 97 dress, high school age, uh, it seems to me that what's interesting about this phenomenon or about this story as it's been told over the years is that is the amount of respect I can have for the people involved as being reliable. Uh, you know, I've known Joe since I was a little boy. Uh, Maude Jeffries, I do know, uh, of course, we put on we put on that UFO thing out in Patterson, 
Mufon came out and said that the Jeffries photographs were definitely fake. And I, just, I mean, this is a this is a this is an organization yeah. that wants UFOs to be real. But I don't. I can't imagine Mon Jeffries faking photographs. <laughs> well, I, I I I know what you're saying, and that's uh, that's uh, exactly uh, some of the things that happened there at that time. Uh, Monty's photographs uh, were different than what uh, Mr. Rutledge, Dr. Rutledge, was able to produce this type of thing. Some of hers they suspect might have been lens flare, and I don't know yeah. much about all of that. But, and what did Monty call those things? She called them something in the sky, but anyway, uh, I, I couldn't debate what she was looking at, what she was saying, you know I mean? Any different than anybody else. And you're right about one thing. A lot of people didn't tell us anything about what they saw because they did not want to be noted as a goofball, mm -hmm. uh, a nut. You know, you're not seeing. You're seeing. You know, I never did see anything except these little lights that the news media is showing now. On I've seen those in the sky when the UFOs, but I never saw anything like Joe did or anybody. But talked to so so many people I've got lots and lots of interviews with people that really saw something would you agree that there's a reliability factor that yes I think it's getting squashed a little bit now because guys like Heine are gone you know and and he was a Air Force worker that they didn't want uh, anybody to believe in these UFOs and and strictly what the news reports today I honestly believe is the fact that because the government doesn't know what it is they don't want to admit it because that shows a failure. And, you know, we're all failures, so they should admit it. Yes, yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, I was in high school when all this was going on. And when I got to college, my dad, you may know him, Tom Reen, uh, taught me into taking this class because he had a conflict, so he couldn't take it himself. Dr. Rutledge had a week-long summer school class on scientific methods of UFO detection. <laughs> and as said, why don't you take it? Because it looks like it'll be a hoot to have on your transcript. So I did. Dr. Rutledge was a very, very nice man. He respected the people of Piedmont. Yes, he did. He wasn't uh, like somebody, okay, I got all this garbage from people who live in St. Louis. Those stupid hillbillies out there have never seen an airplane before. <laughs> Realize this was in the 70s. The latest and greatest trainers were flying over treetop level above our heads. So we saw them all the time. In fact, Reggie Bone's brother did that. Yeah. <laughs> you might remember him as Jim oh, yeah. Bone. And Jim was an Air Force pilot that buzzed Piedmont one year. And I'm surprised he didn't get in trouble about it, but go ahead. <laughs> Oh, Mom and Dad and I were out UFO watching. Oh, Dr. Rutledge is telling this in the class about he was in an airplane and he saw this bright light and he started flying toward it. He almost got to it, it blinked off, and then blinked on over here. So he turned the plane around, went toward it again. Almost got to it, turned off, came on the, it played with it. It yeah. did this back and forth, back and forth, quite a while until he finally got bored and took off, but Dr. Rutledge did. He's telling about this in class, and I said, uh, Dr. Rutledge, sir, um, I witnessed that. We were up on a ridge looking for UFOs, and we saw that happening too. So he was <laughs> he was glad to have something in yeah. class that could corroborate what he was telling yeah. us. Very true. Yeah, he struggled. He struggled tremendously. I, he was a fine man, though. Yes, he was. A wonderful man. I don't know if there's any pictures here that you have any questions about, but there's a lot of a lot. Of this all, um, Don Spiri, is that her? Yeah, Don Spiri uh, put this all together for me a long time ago. I thank her for that, and she gave them back to me, and I put them on loan to the museum here because I think it's part of our county history uh, because it's an unusual thing. Uh, UFO headquarters on the Walter Motel and all the other things. Pictures of Reggie Bone there, uh, talking to us, talking about it. Uh, Maud Jeffries in Oklahoma, the state that you came from, sir. Uh, a lot of UFO investigators came from Oklahoma here. Actually, to, I grew up in Piedmont. Yeah, they, they came to Piedmont to investigate all of these uh, UFO sightings. Um, we had uh, reports from all over the place. Uh, 
it just uh, it was a it was a maddening time that's for sure i'll tell you a quick story about some folks from california that came here they wanted to find a ufo so they came looking for the guy that was telling everybody about ufos and it was me and they all had Where's Mary? Mary wears one of them big old hats out the beach door every once in a while. It circles all the way around, you know, just keeps going. They all wore that type of hat, which I was fine. They all had the same last name, Love. This is California, 1973. Once they found me, they just stood and looked at me. They never asked me a question. And like Mr. Turbo said there, I sure hope they aren't coming here to get me or one of the boys. <laughs> Do you think? I think they've got snacks over there, don't you? Oh boy. <laughs> Keep those boys in the back row, make them last. I want to ask one question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I uh, was. Uh, you went to Hollywood to make a documentary about I did, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen that. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, they they flew me out there on a spaceship and, <laughs> you know, had to buy a shirt when I got there. It cost a lot of money in Los Angeles to even eat a hamburger and a cheeseburger. And, you know, it was really expensive, but uh, it was an interesting trip, I yes. Bet, yes. Uh -huh. Do you believe that with all these observations we have, I truly believe there's something to that. Do you think it would be anything with the UFOs that they would have an interest in this planet? What's going on in this planet? They, uh, well, a lot of people of speculate they came, that if there are really UFOs and it's an alien thing and it's a, <laughs> that it's a mining operation that they do that. We had a lot of sounds of drilling operations out in the Patterson area, people reported that they heard high-pitched sounds, this type of thing, underwater. In fact, on the news today, you could probably watch CBS or one of them, see where the Air Force pilots had photographed the, the, uh, the unidentified flying objects flying along and then they drop into the ocean and they don't even splash. There's no, there's no wake, there's nothing, they just go in. So there, there's something strange and it's, you know, it's time for them to really get serious about looking into it, I suspect. And then maybe we'll all feel a lot better knowing that we weren't all crazy. Now, I quit drinking a long time ago, too. <laughs> yes, sir. Has there been any, uh, I guess, setting, sightings like that that have been in the paper since then? Or was it just that period of time? I suspect there's still sightings, but not much interest uh, like it was in 1973 because of the fact that there was a lot of activity then. Now, why there's not much activity now, I don't know. Maybe if you all go out and start looking at it, I, there'll be activity. I, I can't tell you. Yeah, Joe. We saw a lot of these lights that hung around for two or three years, yeah. off and on. You know, For a while, we could go outside and sit on our front porch and just watch the light show every, every night. You know, We had people would come to our house. Yeah. We lived down close to Brescia Creek. And uh, so, but it, the sightings went on. But uh, you know, after we got ridiculed so much, and a lot of, and, and, and it just became just more every night the same thing. People just kind of got whole hum about it. And, oh yeah, there's another UFO light. Well, working in the reporting business as I did then, it, it it grew on and on and on. It came to a point where what more can you tell? I mean, what I I there's no there's no end to this story. And there's still no end to the story. What uh, what year was it that uh, it was in UFO magazine? It was bogus as heck, but uh, Chester, Illinois, it was visited by aliens. And, and the UFO magazine, it, I yeah. would say it was all bogus. The town was completely destroyed and rebuilt. And, yeah, I don't know that. I see the that copies was. of the magazine, but I can't think of what yeah. years that was. It was somewhere in that area, maybe about 69, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. My friend's father grew up in Fisk and in the whole area before Wapapello was made. And he was telling us about a story about a UFO coming out of Clearwater Lake, coming up and out of the lake. 
Yes, ma'am. Is, is there any truth to this? Yes, we just were telling that story of Gene Coleman and Kathy Leach, the video. That was a video that they had uh, witnessed that object coming out of the lake, red in color, and it was glowing and, and came out of the lake that night. Yes, ma'am. This was many years after all the major sightings, uh, probably late 70s, early 80s, early 80s. My dad was finishing concrete at the school out there, the new school, it's been there for years now. But anyway, he's finishing concrete and the fellow said something about, hey Tom, what was that stuff that people were talking about seeing all the time? And dad said, I don't know, they're back there busy finishing the concrete. And he said, well, it's stuff up in the sky. He says, oh, you mean UFOs? He said, yeah. Well, those just flew by. Those back there finishing the concrete. <laughs> Margaret, did you have a question about I, I just wanted to ask you uh, if it's if it's true that uh, Dr. Rutledge pretty much lost his mind over this. Yes and no. I I don't know for certain about that, but I know that it created a lot of hardships for him. Uh, his desk, his son spoke of that in that UFO conference at Patterson. He son is still going through his work on his desk couldn't it was so disorganized which you know yeah. a lot of people are like that that are very intelligent that's you can find everything on my desk you know, you're sitting where my mind is <laughs> but uh, anyway he he uh he certainly uh was all wrapped up in it so so strongly that uh and because of, of being so intelligent maybe he did suffer from a mental breakdown from it all because he couldn't figure it out. Now, someone with a brain like mine, if I can't figure it out, I just kick it aside and go on, but Dr. Rutledge probably had trouble. Yeah, Camden Clark. What did he say, Ryan? And when you were investigating UFOs, he wants to know what planet they were from. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I think they were from the good ship Lollipop. <laughs> That's my grandson. He's putting me on the spot. Uh, what do you think it was about the 37th parallel? That's where it seems like that these investigators that you saw there from that's where a, a big, large majority, even in Illinois, that's so close to that 37th parallel. All the way through there seems to be where, uh, when they look at a, a site, or a map of, of all the sightings of UFOs, a, a big amount of those fall in that area. I don't know why. For all the 37th parallel around the world, and you'll answer your own question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly right. Okay. So what? Okay, so what? Do you know what? The stone hinges on there, the pyramids are on there. If you draw the 37th parallel around the world, you'll understand the four corners, the uh, ne the um, place there where, I forgot what it's called. Mayans? No, the, no, the mountains there. In Arizona. Anyway, if you draw 37 degrees up, if you go all the way around the world on the 37th parallel, you'll see a lot of stuff that's a lot wow. of strange things are at the 37th parallel uh, worldwide, is what you're saying? Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. You can be excused if you if you need to, to leave. It uh, you know we're just we're, we're wrapping up here. They've got some snacks back here. I do appreciate you coming, and David has a final word for you. I was trying to grow up some business for you tonight from Greenville, and uh, I asked one old man. I said, "What was going on around Greenville?" And he said, "Son, we didn't see anything in Greenville, but still it's blowing up." <laughs> Let me tell you, there was a man from Greenville that uh, had uh, witnessed, he was a truck driver, and he did witness um, a bright light that actually Dr. Rutledge investigated, and it uh, actually was so bright that it, 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 it scorched his glasses, his eyeglasses. And there's photographs of the fellow, the Highway Patrol, Ed Wright, Sergeant Ed Wright at that time, he investigated along with Dr. Rutledge what had happened to this fellow. Very lengthy, long article about him. I don't remember his name, I didn't bring it with me, but that he was from Greenville. 
So there was something going on over there, too. He might have been the one who had to steal. <laughs> Before everyone leaves, we have a, I have an update up here on some things I want to address in the way of business. Um, this Wayne County Historical Society is in the process of selling the Piedmont Small Engines building. Kathy uh, is out of uh, business. She's retired. And uh, we're in the process of selling that to James Turnbow. Uh, he's given us $5,000 earnest money down, and we're waiting <coughs> on for the tenants uh, in the back of the building to remove their possessions, and uh, we'll be closing that deal. As I said, our next meeting will be Eagle Sky in August. And uh, we'd like to have a good representation at that uh, Hall of Honor banquet. And again, the t-shirts, raffle tickets for the gun, memberships, if you want to join, let us know. Um, and our next public meeting that will be here will be in October, and then we're going to have some elections. We have six seats coming up. Uh, Gary Beisman, Russ Moore, and Harold Twibble are up for re-election for a two-year term if they want to seek re-election. And anyone else who wants to get their name in that pot for a board member, you're free to do so if you're a member. And then myself and Rita Clemens and Ron Henson are up for re-election for a one-year term. We were appointed last year because of COVID, we was not meeting. And anyone who wants to have a one-year term, put your name in the pot, or uh, you can have an election. And before we leave, uh, Dennis, in addition to being a many things, is also an artist. This is one of the gentlemen we will be honoring at the Hall of Honor Banquet. This was, he, Dennis created this from a Xerox copy of a, a photograph of an original portrait that burnt many years ago. This is Ezekiel Rubottom. This was the gentleman uh, who represented Wayne County. And by the way, at the time, Wayne County went from the middle part of what is now Bullinger County all the way to Kansas. He represented that uh, uh, Wayne County to the General Assembly and uh, helped create Missouri. This is Ezekiel Rubottom. He, he did a lot of good things. And uh, he helped name Greenville, helped established Wayne County. He was our Indian agent. There was Native Americans here then, and he was the Indian agent. And uh, on behalf of the Historical Society, let's give this a round of applause for the Pearl Road Band. <laughs> Is there anything, any questions anyone has for the Historical Society as far as business? We didn't have any business to bring up. If not, I want to ask everyone to rise, and Russ, would you ask the blessing on the refreshments? I will. Dear Lord, we'd just like to thank you for being you. We'd like to thank you for, for all these folks that showed up here tonight. We hope that, that they enjoyed it, and we wish them a safe trip back home, and bless this food that we're about to eat. Bye. Amen. Thank you very much.